So um, today there are three lectures again. Um, and the first one is about parallelism. So the first thing I um, discuss always with parallelism is so what's the difference between parallelism on the one side and concurrency on the other side. So a lot of people um, use these terms uh, synonym, um, but um, I want to distinguish them actually. So does anybody have a suggestion? So parallelism is an evaluation strategy. So you can evaluate something in parallel or you can evaluate it sequentially. You should always get the same result. Yeah, it's deterministic. <clears throat> so the yeah the concurrent computation on the other hand is about managing events that happen at the same time. And you can't control when they happen, so it's non-deterministic. So the um, example I like to use is like if you have a restaurant, right? So then you know the guests arrive and place some orders, so that you know happens concurrently, that's concurrency, and then in the kitchen you can either decide to prepare the food sequentially or concurrently, but the, uh, or in parallel, sorry, but the result um, should be the same. Yeah, so that's uh, the difference. So concurrency we're not going to talk about in this intro. I just wanted to make the yeah, point that they are different. Scheduling of tasks, yeah, right. So this is usually, so scheduling usually has to do with concurrency where you have different, you know, processes and you don't know, you know, what they're going to do and you have to deal with it somehow, uh, schedule them. So, um, right, that is um, um, concurrency. If you implement um, parallelism, yeah, you can do that like in the same way that you have tasks and a scheduler and so on. So you can use um, concurrency to implement the parallelism. So that's a relation. Yeah. But the, the point is the parallelism should really, you know, not affect the outcome. So this is something you can choose to do or not to do and it shouldn't affect the outcome. Concurrency, you never know what you get. So, you know, you run it once and you get one result, you run it again, you get another result. So, <clears throat> okay. So, the language I wanna use, um, I call it P, PCF, parallel PCF and um, the same as we did for the sums and products, we use uh, the simplest form um, binary fork join. Um, again, you know, we could um, use something that's um, more realistic, but um, this already shows all the 
you know, um, interesting points. So now we have, in our expression language, we have DCF. So you have what was that? So natural numbers, um, the fixed point, right? And uh, the only thing we add that's new is our construct for parallel evaluation. So, <clears throat> so that's how this looks. Um, the concrete syntax um, squeeze it in here. Looks like a let. Yeah, but just a let where you um, have two E1s that you bind two variables. So here you have the E1 and the E2, and they can potentially be executed in parallel, and then the result of E1 and E2 is used inside E. I mean, it's not necessary to do it like that, so you could also say, like, well, you leave the language before as is, and you just start, you know, evaluating some things in parallel, but yeah, we decide to add a construct, everything else is evaluated sequentially, except this parallel thing, yeah. Right. So, we are uh, talking about data which might be shared with even and No, here we have a functional setting. There's no shared data. Yeah. So, then we can run any expression in Right. We could, we could theoretically also run other parts of the evaluation in parallel, but here we say like, okay, we want to make the parallelism, the you know, user has to make it explicit. Yeah. That's just a, a choice we make. So the statics. So, yeah, what do I have to write? So, let's start with the E, uh, E1, sorry. So, what type should E1 have? Same as? Same as X1, exactly. So, let's just say tau1. And the same for the E2, tau2, and now the result of both of them I can use inside E. So X has type tau1, uh, X1 has type tau1, X2 has type tau2, and E has to have type tau. Yeah, everything else stays the same. And <clears throat> what about the dynamics? So nobody, as I said, you know, with parallelism, you can either you know do it in parallel or you can do it sequentially. So let's look at both versions.
and then we can compare them. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I define two different structural dynamics now, and the rules you've seen yesterday for PCF just carry over to both of them. Okay, so they are unchanged, but then the ones you have for the par construct, they are different. So, yeah, in the sequential version, I just start evaluating E1 until it's a value. Once it's a value, <clears throat> I move over to the X2. So if E1 is a value, then I start stepping in the E2. And if they're both done, they're both values, then I substitute. Yeah, so this notation just means they are both substituted at the same time. So <clears throat> and of course they're supposed to be values. Okay. Fair enough, so, and now we want to define the parallel version where we don't do one after another, but we do both of them simultaneously. So, So if I can make a step in E1 and E2, well then I just do it. I step in both of them. So E1 prime, E2 steps to E2. And the par steps accordingly. So now, of course, I have the problem that, um, well, one of them can be a value and then I have to do the other one that's not a value yet. So, So let's say E is a value, uh, E1 is a value, sorry. So then I just step inside the E2. So 
So then, symmetrically, what can happen is that the um, E2 is a value. So then we step inside the E1. If one goes to E1 prime. And then we have the last rule where both of them are values. Substitute again. of them are values, E1 value and E2 value. Yeah. Oh, so you say like we can do the substitution earlier, right? I mean, sure, we could do that, but it's really not a difference. I mean, the number of steps um, that doesn't change, yeah. Because you have to do the final substitution anyway for the last one, so might as well substitute both at the end, yeah. But it, doesn't that question bring back the call by value, call by name distinction? Right, so here we do call by value. Sure. Yeah, so the, yeah, that's a good question. It's so a choice. Yeah, it's a choice. choose to do call by value. Right, right. So we do call by value. Um, I'm not even sure if you had call by name how you would do the parallel evaluation. You do substitute. Don't you just do substitutes without checking whether it's a final state? Right, but then you lose control over evaluating it in parallel, right? So. With, yeah, it's a bit unclear if you would, how you would define the parallel steps if you would have call by name. Um, Is it because they can refer to the same name at the same time? Um, well, it's just like, be, I mean, what you would do is you would, um, may you just have this one rule here, right, where you say um, without them being a value, you substitute them in, and then what you're gonna do, I mean, then you're done with your rule and you have no control anymore when it will get evaluated, right? So you would have to do it at some other spot in the rules and make sure like the parallelism is executed there, but it's more complicated, right? Yeah, you can't do it in the rule for the, for the par anymore. Yeah. Can you have like a narrow and seek it's going to be another judgment? Oh, right, 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 yeah, that I always do. So the, everything here should be the sequential one on this board. Yeah, I always forget to, to write these subscripts. So this is all the sequential one and this is all the parallel one. So it also has subscripts here. So this is par, par, par. Yeah, thank you. Why even if even find translation is parallel, shouldn't it be sequential? Uh, basically what we are saying is the individual things are still sequential, just the just the parallel statement is happening in parallel. Right, but inside the E1, the E1 might be another par. Oh, okay. Right, so you can 
Ja, nästa. Yep, right. That's basically the synchronization. The result of the E1 and E2 is required by E, so that's where, where, where you have to, you know, you can't start with the E yet because they are still waiting, or the, the E is still waiting for the result, so you can call it the synchronization point, right? Maybe that's why we, do, we shouldn't be doing substitution ahead of time in E, even though E2 is available, otherwise we will, uh, we, we will lose the yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, a good way to to think about it. Yeah, if you do the substitution, uh, then you lose the synchronization point. You cannot control the parallelism anymore, right? <clears throat> okay. So um, I promised you um, a use case for the evaluation dynamics. Um, so. Yeah, what should the relation be between the parallel and the sequential evaluation here? Yeah, they should be the same. They should give the same result. Uh, so, so what we want to prove is um, if I can go to a value in the parallel evaluation, then I can go to the same value v with you know some number of steps in the sequential evaluation. So, and if I try to prove that, so which side is the difficult one? Yeah, I think it's this one. So you would probably, oh, this is German. So, yeah, so if you have a, a sequential, evaluation that ends in the value. So the idea you might have is to do an induction on the number of steps and then show that you reach the same value in the, on the parallel side. But the problem is, as I mentioned already last time, that you have intermediate um, 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 states, right? So the like expressions that are not values yet and you to make the induction go through, you have to generalize it. So, and then you might have the idea to say something like, oh, well, you know, um, what I prove is something like this. So, if, well, let's say n, you have the sequential one steps to v in uh, steps to e prime. So we want to generalize it in n steps. Now let's just say implies. <clears throat> that on the parallel end, we can also step to the same E prime. So what do you say? Does it sound like a good plan? Why not? Right, but that's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you had an, no, behind you, an idea. Yeah, 
Exactly, the intermediate steps are not the same, right? So there might be no such E prime here because like if you start, you make a step in the sequential version, you make a step only inside the, where is it? Um, inside the E1, but in the parallel one, you make two steps and so you don't have the same E prime. You can never reach this like E prime that, that you had like in the sequential one. And actually it's also true in the other direction. That's something I didn't even realize, right? Because also uh, you, if you start like with a parallel one, you step inside both E1 and E2, but in the sequential one, you can never reach this intermediate state because the E1 is like further ahead already. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So that's the solution. We do a um, big step as an intermediate um, yeah, um, um, way to help us to finish the proof. So. So instead, <clears throat> so let's do the sequential first. So <clears throat> so if we you know, reach a value in the sequential case, then we reach the same value um, when we use the evaluation dynamics. And the same is true for the parallel one. And then we've shown both of this. We've shown our theorem. <clears throat> okay, but before we start the proof, we first have to define the evaluation dynamics for the parallel. We haven't done that yet. Again, it will be the case that all the rules carry over um, from the PCF that you've seen yesterday, we only add one new rule. What do I do? Well, first I evaluate the E1, get V1, two, V2, <clears throat> and then I substitute in for E, uh, for X1 and X2 in E. So what goes in there? Uh, V1. V2 and then this is the final result. Yeah. No, PCF is not a total language. Because you have the fixed point, so you can have infinite loops. So how does this theorem and say like uh, you know, parallel or you can have things that are terminated? Right. So this um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's a good question. So what about um, non terminating computation? So that's something we don't talk about. Um, but this is something we get automatically if we assume that the program is well typed because it can't get stuck, right? If you prove the theorem at the top, so E is well typed, so you know it, it can't get stuck. So, um, well, you know, assume that 
it would diverge in the um, parallel case and it would give you value in the sequential case, well then it's a contradiction because the theorem says it would also give you value in the um, 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 parallel case. So that's kind of like all you need because of the uh, type soundness. No, no, you don't have to. Because, um, um, yeah, exactly, if they're well typed. So then you don't have to. Otherwise, you don't know. I mean, otherwise, there's kind of like a, a, a hole in the, in the theorem. But for well typed ones, we're good. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Um, do uh, plenty of time. So let's maybe do. Um, one part of the proof, um, maybe squeeze it in here. Okay, let's do this part. Um, so, how would you approach that? How would you prove it? Rule induction, exactly. And rule induction on what? On the... Right. <laughs> so... On the number of steps, well, I mean, that's usually a bad idea if it's on the, you know, right-hand side of the implication. It usually um, doesn't work. So it's usually the thing on the left-hand side of the impl uh, implication that <coughs> you want to use. So induction, yeah, rule induction on the derivation. <clears throat> of our evaluation judgment. So, yeah, now how does this rule induction work again? So we have to go through all the, you know, possible rules. So let's say like, okay, the yeah, the Um, derivation ends with a rule for the par construct over here. Well, so then what do we know? Um, then we know a lot of things already. So we know that E, yeah, name clash, um, so let's call this E prime here. Uh, well, not yet. E1, E2, so then we know but just by looking at the rule, the E must have had this form. We also know that E1 evaluates to v1 for some v1. We also know that e2 v2 and we also know that v1 v2 x1 x2 E evaluate E prime evaluates to V. So now we can use the induction hypothesis for these three things, right? 
this is kind of like the n minus one case. Um, that's how the the rule induction works. So we know e one steps to oh, v one e two. steps to v2 and the e prime with all the stuff substituted steps to v yeah that we know by induction so now well, what do we have to show? Now we have to show that E, which looks like this, E1, 2, steps, and some number of steps, To V. <clears throat> so why is this the case? I mean, what's the, you know, what's the strategy? How do we reach V? We have already some, you know, building building blocks that we're going to use. So if you look at the rule, now well, the sequential one is hidden now. So we know that the E1 reaches at some point the V1, right? So what we're going to do is we apply a bunch of times this rule, namely, you know, the number of times um, as it took to reach the V1 and the E1. So then we have a value there. Then we're going to use this rule. And again, you know, we use this rule like a bunch of times, but we know from our induction hypothesis that we reach the V2 at some point, and then do the substitution, and then <clears throat> it follows directly from the third fact that we're going to reach our V. So, So first, we have to show by induction on the number of steps that we make um, that, oh, here, maybe let me, so here I forgot a star, but maybe let me replace the star with some concrete numbers, so they are you know, always some numbers if we have the star. And here we don't need it, here it's still the star. Sorry about that. Um, so first we show by induction on N1 that we can reach this state <clears throat> where the E1 became the V1. Yeah, by using this first rule over and over again, then you show by induction on and two, that by using the second rule over and over again, that we can step from V2, E2,
right? And now we know what to do, the rest is easy, so now we just apply Um, oh, right, so that's the number of steps we've taken now, right. But how do we proceed? I mean, we're not done yet, right? We want to reach V. Wouldn't the substitution show that? Wouldn't the substitution not be star, but be N1 plus N2? Oh, yeah, yeah. So here, um, no. So that's a completely different number. This is N3 here. Because now, I mean, what you're going to do is, so now you have two values here. So now, like, third thing we do is we make the step where we substitute, right? So we use the third. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just by using the, the third rule that we have, we can make the step. And then the fourth thing is, well, we know it already, so we're done. Yeah. So... Yeah, so here we use the rule, and here um, we also use the induction hypothesis, right, for both of them. So, and that's it. And the other cases are very similar. Oh, uh, yeah. So, in what way did we show that the premises are the thing that imply the conclusion, instead of just showing, like, the conclusion? Right, I mean, this is this whole, like, rule induction. Yeah. So, that's a, you only have to say, like, that, like, you assume you already have the property you want to prove for the premises, right. and then you show that it holds for the conclusion. Because it is those premises that get invoked when you like, transform the conclusion into the form you want it to begin. Right, so I mean, you can think of it as like it's the same thing as induction on the natural numbers, yeah. right? So you assume it holds already for n minus 1, and then you prove it for n, and then you showed it, you know, for all of them. And the reason is you can think of it like you, know, you you prove it for every derivation tree. You say, you know, well, if the derivation tree ends, um, the application of this par rule, well, you know, I can assume that I've already like proven it for everything that's been derived in the subtrees, and so. Of course, you have to also show it for me, right? So, um, and that's kind of like where you start. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, you, I mean, you could certainly show that like, you know, the, um, programs are equivalent if you replace the par with a let, but then would it make your job some? Also, um, you would have to show that the programs are equivalent, and then you get into a lot of trouble. So this is something that you know Paul will tell you about maybe a bit, not with the logical relations and so on. Yeah. So the like you know. When are two programs equivalent? Difficult question. Yeah. So, 
um, in general. Here it's maybe not so hard. Okay, good. Yeah, another question. Small step, big step kind of, kind of stuff. It's, it's just still not clear to me why you use a star instead of like there exists an N. Oh, it's no, there's no reason for that. That's really a, a detail. And over yeah. here on number three, on number three, that really is a, a one step. Yeah, number three is really one step. Specifically. Yeah. So that's kind of like the, the um, work we have to do. Um, well, I mean, we have to do, you know, so for four, we really don't have to do anything. We get it right away. Um, here, we have to come up with the right rule to use so that we can use this fact here and kind of like get down. Here, we also have to do some work. Here, we also have to do some work, find this rule that it exists. And so, yeah. So it would be trivial to run a counter, really, n1 plus n2 plus, plus n3 plus 1. Right, so if you, okay, so you are, you know, way ahead of us already. So okay. you are thinking about, like, how many steps yeah. does it take in total? Right. Right, and that's, if, if, yeah, that's n1 plus n2 plus n3 plus 1. But this is even something we're not talking about yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, no, we still have that. We still have that. Yeah, we still have. Um, I didn't write. Um, so at the beginning, I didn't write down everything we have. We just have the um, PCF plus. The parallel. Really so, a, yeah, yeah every, superset. right, exactly, exactly. It's a superset of PCF. What we have, yeah. Okay, good. So the um, other direction. So, not going to do more proofs today, but I just want to mention. Uh, I just want to mention the other direction. So, um, wait, what happened to our lemma? Oh, yeah, right. So, So now it looks like we have the same problem where we have to reason these about these intermediate states, right? I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, induction on the number of steps you used. Um, but then, yeah, what about uh, these, you know, non-values that you see? How can you use the induction hypothesis? So what we show instead There's a generalization. If we do one step, and is it really just one? Yes. Um, 
and then can get a value in the evaluation dynamics then we already get this value when we start from E so why does that help? so let's assume we have shown this already so then we can by induction you know um, like get this up here like by step by step right so we're saying like okay well assume you know that you make um, zero steps here well um, then you have it right away anyway so and if you make n steps well then you know by induction you kind of like have it for for this part and um, then you kind of like use this um, 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 yeah, lemma here to lift it like to the to the case uh, where you did n steps, and yeah, this is um, not so um, difficult to show. So this you prove by induction on the derivation of this um, step relation. So that's a good homework exercise. Um, yeah, so, oh yeah, I was supposed to say that. So I will um, post on Piazza a list of all the homeworks, if I remember, but then you can also, you know, add to it if you made some notes to what I suggested. But this, yeah, the proof of this lemma two here is, is a good homework exercise. <clears throat> okay, so, Good. <clears throat> now um, we want to talk about uh, cost semantics again. So, Oh, yes. The same, yeah, I didn't write that a good point. So now we only looked at the sequential, but you can prove the same thing and replace the, like, you know, sequential with parallel. And uh, proofs are almost identical. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, we had this cost semantics where we related the cost by the semantics to steps in the structural dynamics. And now um, <clears throat> can we do maybe something that captures the sequential and parallel cost both at once? So, yeah, something that looks like this, where K is yeah, some notion of cost that describes. both sequential and parallel cost. So one thing you can of course do is you can just say, oh well, K should be a pair, right? So we keep track of two numbers um, and that's fine. You can do that. Um, but here I want to introduce um, something that's called a cost graph so and this is um, what this k is gonna be <laughs> uh, 
Uh, not sure if I should really erase this. But it's taking a lot of space, so yeah, I'll probably have to go. Yeah, so this is um, going to be a two-step process. So first we record during the evaluation this cost graph. And then in the second step, we define what the parallel and sequential cost given by this cost graph is. So. So a cost graph is either cost one or cost zero. So this is the unit cost. Yeah, and it's fine to just have like this unit, right? So if you want to have like cost, you know, two, then you can just have two of these units. Um, So and then we have the right, which one is this um, parallel combination? And the sequential combination. Right, and now we want to define given, so this is what we will yeah, record during the evaluation. And now we want to say what is the sequential cost, so this is the work. So work of one, is one, work of zero is zero, the work of the parallel composition is the sum of the works. Yeah, because now we're counting the sequential cost. But we are finding cost, uh, so C1 and C2 are parallel executions, right? Cost of... Right, yeah, but if we... So we had these two dynamics, right? The parallel one and the sequential one. So if we want to describe the cost of the sequential one, we have to add the cost up, like in this proof you've seen, because you don't do things in parallel. No, no, no. So the work is the same. So the work for C1 plus C2 is the work plus C2, 2. And then you have the sp span, oh, I call it depths today. So this is the parallel cost. And there you have the distinction, right? So the depths of one is one, the depths of zero is zero, and now this is what confuses you. 
So here you have the max now, right? So this is um, Yeah, we had these two different dynamics, and now we have the two different cost measures to, to measure it, the work and the depth. So in here, oops, for this one, we have also plus. in the parallel case. And yeah, as I said, you know, we you don't have to do it like that with like this cost graph. You can also keep track, you know, of two numbers and you know do do this kind of like operation directly as you go through. But yeah, I thought it's kind of like yeah nice to do it with this um, cost graph. Yeah. Does the, uh, the depth operator and the work operator ever like cross paths? Do they sort of like have it no, they're completely separated. That'll, that'll, that'll never really happen. Yeah. Like, in the, if we arrange like our, our jobs on on like a binary tree, we're saying like uh, we're taking we're talking max depth because we're saying like each subtree can happen at the same time. Right. Right. So so this is closer. This is closer to time than it is to space. Oh yeah, right. So this is um, this is basically for time. Yeah. I mean, space and parallel. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's probably no difference. I mean, would maybe be a bit higher because you have some overhead, right? But um, so this um, work of C1 tensor product C2. What that is is that's a that's a a, a parallel. <coughs> So parallel expression in sequential dynamics means I have a lot of time and I don't have enough space. So <laughs> I smash the, you know, I smash the tree back into a line. Right. I mean, I'm not sure if you, what your motivation is. I mean, that's a, a different story. But you just do it sequentially anyway. Okay. So, you, so we we have a parallel expression, and we have a notion of doing a parallel expression sequentially. Right. Which is different from doing a parallel expression parallelly, but you also have doing sequential expressions in either case. Right, and you always do them sequentially. Okay, so sequential expressions always. Yeah. So the rules from last lecture all carry over. They, they all carry. Yeah. Um, no, uh, the number of steps is really different because here for this one at the top you count only one step, right? Yeah. Even though you make two steps inside the, the, the ones, you only count one step for this one. Yeah. So the number of steps is really different for both of them. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so now we have to write down all the rules and then afterwards we come to the fun part. <clears throat> oh, 
Okay, so let's see. Let's start maybe with uh, zero. And yeah, as before, our goal is to reflect the number of steps in the sequential one and in the parallel one as given by the work and the depths. And so that's why we have to use zero here again, which is a bit strange. I mean, it's the same kind of like de defect um, that you've seen last time. And yeah, we'll talk about that a bit more later. So the same for the successor. We yeah, don't you know, charge anything extra for it. Um, <clears throat> what else do we have? Oh yeah, so we have another value, the functions. Same thing, cost zero. Um, so, <clears throat> well, this is interesting, so maybe um, let's do the fix. Here we just substitute the whole thing. For X and run the E, have some cost, and then we have a sequential cost of one here, like yesterday. Um, so maybe let's look at the function application. So first we evaluate the E1, get the cost graph C1, and hopefully we end up with a lambda. So then we move on to the E2 and get a value V2. And finally, we run the function body. Um, with the argument substituted, of course. V2 goes in for X, E. So, and what is the cost of the whole thing? Well, we do it all, even though we could do it in parallel. It's doing anything in, in parallel. So here we just have cost plus one. So I'm not showing the um, conditional, but so that Something yeah, you can also do at home or look up in PFPL, but of course we got to do the parallel one. So that's an interesting one. So now what do I do? So I first <clears throat> evaluate the E1, get cost C1, then I evaluate the E2, get cost C2, and then 
I substitute stuff in. Cos C3. <clears throat> so now what is the cost of the whole thing? And now we're going to have some parallel costs, right? So C1 and C2 can go in parallel. Oops. And then C3 is sequential. And then I think we have one extra cost here. Which is a bit annoying. Um, <clears throat> yeah, which, I mean, what does it mean that you have this extra one there? Well, it basically means that um, if you, you know, want to like do a write a recursive function and like do something, you know, maybe for um, a list, yeah, you want to do map over a list. So then, um, you will never have a um, parallel cost that's constant because you have this, you know, extra one, so you get the spine that has like linear cost. So that's kind of like a bit of a defect of this um, binary fork join. Then again, you know, nobody forces you to write the cost semantics like that. You can also do it differently if you can justify it. So here again, our justification for like why doing it like that is we related to the structural dynamics. Excuse me. <clears throat> so what's the theorem? So Well, first, if I evaluate E um, and I have cost C get a value V, then what do I know about the <clears throat> structural dynamics? Well, so the number of steps I take sequentially is the work of this cost graph C. And the number of steps I take in the parallel one is the depth of the cost graph C. And of course, we get the same value. Yeah, so. So then E, if I reach <clears throat> sequentially starting from E a value V in W steps, then There exists a C, so that I reach the same value under this call gra uh, cost graph, some C, <clears throat> and the work of C is W.
And the last part is the same thing sequentially. So, uh, parallel, sequential we had already. So, And here we have the depth <clears throat> Yeah, so Yeah, and the proof of this is similar to the theorem that we proved, but now you have this, you know, you were already um, ahead of your time. Um, now you have to reason about the number of steps and so on and this cost graph. Um, and you, yeah, so. Which comes down to just addition versus max. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that's the only difference. So, um, yeah, so this work and depth, so do you say these are like realistic cost measures? So, I mean, does it have anything to do with like, you know, running the code on a computer? And you don't have, you know, an unlimited amount of processors, right? So that doesn't seem to make much sense, you, you would think at first, but after the break, um, I will um, show you a theorem that relates like these high level cost measures to the actual cost of evaluating such a program, at least asymptotically, um, um, on you know, a machine with a fixed number of processors. So, and this is called Brand's theorem. And um, yeah, but now 10 minute, 15 minute, 10. <laughs> Not enough hands, okay, 15 minutes break.